Hi, welcome everybody, and thank you for joining us for today's Mid-Atlantic Center webinar. Uh, it is called Games Are For Everyone, Creating an Accessible Gaming Event. And we are fortunate <coughs> to have with us today, we have uh, Angie Brunk and Daniel Ireton from all the way out in Kansas. Um, <laughs> so thank goodness we have virtual. Um, so they're going to walk us through some tips and, um, you know, suggestions for creating a more accessible gaming experience. So I'm going to hand it over to you folks. Thanks so much for being here. Great. Right. All right. Thanks so much. So yeah, uh, our talk is games are for everyone. Uh, and uh, in order to make games for everyone, a uh, great way to do that is to create an accessible gaming and event. And so that's what, uh, what Angie and I are going to talk about today. Um, how uh, some tips and tricks on how uh, you can make an event to bring people into, um, into your space, into your organization. And in a uh, in a in a lighter and fun way, really get them start thinking more about accessibility itself. Right. So I'm Angie Brunk. I have previously, before I joined K State, done a little bit of research on games and accessibility. I also have a master's degree in human factors, and I'm visually impaired myself. I was born with cataracts. So I have both academic and practical experience with accessible and inclusive design. And um, well, I've been a, a game geek for 30 plus years, um, pretty much since I decided I didn't have any real hope of being cool in school, uh, somewhere around 11 or 12, I gave up on that. Uh, and, um, so I've been a player of games of all types for most of my life. And, um, when I got into libraries and academia, I started seeing ways that, uh, games could have a strong impact in education and how, uh, game design, uh, can, uh, relate to a lot of other disciplines and is in fact, it's, it's a worthwhile pursuit in and of itself. Um, so yeah, how we got started. So I had a background in accessible design and I had previously gotten started by researching active learning activities and their accessibility. Um, one of my very first academic papers as a working librarian was partnering with um, a library science professor who also had a PhD in voc rehab. And we critique some activities that showed up in a library instruction cookbook because I looked at those and I went, huh, that activity would not be good for someone with low vision. Oh, that's not good if you have limited mobility. And, you know, seeing that games are becoming more and more a part of education, I saw a real need for more active research by disabled people in especially the intersection of games and education. And then I discovered I like games too. It's sometimes you don't learn that you like games until you meet both the right game and more importantly, the right group of players. Um, so I, as I said, I'm a longtime gamer and at this point, a longtime game researcher. Um, I had not worked very closely with accessibility prior to uh, working with Angie. Um, we found ourselves both on uh, the web development team for uh, K-State Libraries. And uh, one of the things that, um, of course, Angie focused on was accessibility. And this was something that almost immediately grabbed my attention as well as an issue that needed uh, needed more discussion. Really, it just, we have a long way to go on uh becoming, frankly, an ethical society as regards individuals with disabilities. Um, and I saw the applicability of accessibility issues uh, with games. And so uh, that kind of led to us uh, finding ways we could dovetail these things together. <clears throat> so we hope to gain a few things by doing this gaming event. 
we wanted to show off our innovation lab and what it could do. So show, by showing off some of the 3D printed tokens that we made or other modifications that we've made to games using our innovation lab. We wanted to create a great gaming event that was welcoming to people. Um, we wanted to get people to think about accessibility without hitting them over the head or being heavy handed in activism, but in a way that would actually lead them to think on their own and to think it was their own idea too. Um, and then we wanted to create more connection between libraries, gaming and accessibility. So um, something to consider here, too, are the types of games, um, because uh, gamers come in a variety of types of people. Uh, they're going to uh, different games are going to work both better for different disabilities and just having a broad appeal of things for people to try. Um, social deduction. This is uh, things like werewolf, mafia, a uh, little later, later on, we're going to talk a lot about Avalon. Um, essentially, you're, you're sitting around a table trying to figure out who is the traitor or who is the liar or who is the killer and um just basically uh there's a lot of argument a lot of discussion uh, uh a lot of deception and uh betrayal so it's the kind of game that appeals uh if, if you are wanting a more of a social experience uh while kind of telling a story a social deduction is fantastic for that uh, trick taking this just refers to uh really probably a lot of card games you're familiar with um bridge hearts pitch euchre anywhere uh you're you're laying down and collecting cards uh and and scoring points through that there are a lot of um now uh, sort of prestige games that utilize the uh, trick-taking mechanic but are made with their own cards and have their own uh, sorts of goals and things in mind. Not as flexible uh, as just having a deck of cards, but really a greater depth of experience uh, with a lot of those. Uh, a narrative game, um, you know, one of the gold standards for that is uh, Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, you're telling a story as a group with some with some guidance uh from from kind of a central narrator or dungeon master if you prefer um the big thing with dungeons and dragons that can make it problematic for uh an event like this is that typically you're talking about a group that's meeting multiple times in a month and carrying the same game with the same characters and storyline on for uh in some cases years um a narrative game that hits a lot of those same notes is going to be something that's a small box, short storytelling game, uh, something like uh, Choose Your Own Adventure, uh, which is the... Uh, a number of games uh, based on the uh, book series of the same name that we, you know, all knew and loved in the 80s and 90s. Um, other games like Sherling, Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective, where the players are all cooperating. And, and that is a, a nature of narrative games, too, is there tends to be uh, at least some kind of cooperative element among the players. Uh, polyominoes, uh, sometimes I just call that a uh, analog Tetris. It's uh, you're working with your pieces to get them into the right place and create patterns and uh, points are awarded based on those patterns. Uh, worker placement, your You've got your different pieces. You're using them uh, on the board to take certain actions, uh, also using them to kind of block other players from what they need to do. Um, sometimes these are uh, relatively serene where you're creating your own little tableau. And sometimes they're very heavily interactive where players are interfering with each other a lot. So there can be a, a wide variety in both themes and uh, play uh, within that. Uh, roll and move, that's your very simple uh, thing Things like Monopoly or uh, Trouble or Life, where you're just um, you you roll a die or or spin a spinner or draw a card, you move forward a number of squares, and when you arrive there, something happens. Um, while there is uh, you know some strategy in uh, games of this type, it does come down to a lot of luck. 
Um, nothing wrong with that, but it is kind of a, a particular style. And then your party games or casual games. This is stuff like uh, Cards Against Humanity, um, Trivial Pursuit. Uh, trivia games kind of fall into the uh, party game, casual game category. This is something for groups that really just want to get together and have a game as kind of a social lubricant that they that uh, keeps conversation going while it's really just uh, you know facilitating a social interaction. Um, part of the reason for these different types of games is that uh, you're also going to see a lot of different types of gamers. Uh, these are referred to as Bartle types or, or uh, Bartle types of players, Bartle player types. And it uh, you can see the, the two axes there. There's acting versus interacting and players versus the world, sort of where they where these Bartle types fall on the uh, the uh on on the uh, uh uh spectrum here so interacting really kind of implies that uh you're just uh trying to see what's going on you're having fun you're not really goal oriented in terms of uh winning you're just kind of either having a good time with friends or seeing what the game has on offer seeing just trying to figure out how it works or how the world setting operates um then you have the acting side where your achievers are acting Acting on the world of the game. They're very driven. They are trying to win the game. And then you've got your killers who are acting on other players. Uh, killers are, uh, they can be trolls in a sense. They're not necessarily playing the game to win, though that's a bonus. They're playing a game to uh, see what sorts of reactions. Uh, they're, they're essentially poking their fellow players with a stick. Um, I will say socializers, this makes up about 80% of the gaming population. Most people are just wanting to get together with friends. Your explorers and achievers are both at about 10% apiece. You're interacting with the game world and just are you looking around at it or are you trying to conquer it? And then fortunately, less than 1% of gamers are uh, your killers. Now, very experienced gamers like myself, uh, it depends on who I'm playing with and what I'm playing, where I and and kind of what mood I'm in. I am going to switch back and forth. Um, I try to just be a killer when I know I'm playing with other killers, but uh, it, it does come up. And that's not a bad way to try and arrange your events. Uh, certain games are uh, very conflict-oriented between players. And uh, if you can get all of your killers at the same table, uh, they're, they're, own, they're having a great time uh, just trying to troll one another. Um, but anyway, that's uh, that's just kind of what our what our types of gamers are, the types of folks that you're usually working with. Okay, so there's some real barriers to accessibility. First thing we need to deal with the 800 pound gorilla that's sitting around in the room. There is no universally accessible game, just as there is no universally appealing game. There's no universally accessible game. Um, the needs of people are complex and sometimes conflicting. So um, you're just not going to find that. So the focus then needs to be on creating an event, an overall structure that is accessible and that offers something for everybody. Um, some of the common barriers we see, pieces can be too small or too fiddly to grasp. They can be difficult to see. Um, or completely lacking in tactile information. Game types or rules do not play well with certain neurotypes, cognitive disabilities, intellectual disabilities, or mental illnesses. Um, the game might not work well in ASL, although I would argue there are some games that might be a little easier to play if you know ASL. Um, information is conveyed only by color which is huge. Uh, and one, manufacturers really need to get away from double quick. And it can be hard for a disabled person to conceal information. I was born with cataracts, so I don't understand what other people can see. I might think I'm concealing the information and the person sitting beside me can see it super easy. 
Um, so that can put me at a real disadvantage in games. And um, especially if concealing information is part of the game. So the types of tokens we use or how much information is, con is conveyed on cards can certainly also create additional barriers that a lot of people don't realize exist. Um, and really one of the larger barriers and one that it's super important to overcome is that there are some great gamers. I'm really thrilled that our local game store has a ladies game night because women have historically really been excluded from the gaming community. Um, and, you know, meeting Dan and working with other gamers that he works with has helped a lot. And I've realized, oh, I actually like games. It was toxic people I didn't like. Um, but within the gaming community, there are very well known issues with gatekeeping and, you know, just toxic personalities. Um, and that tends to strike harder on disabled people because there's already just social gatekeeping around disability anyway. And then you get into a community that has even more gatekeeping. It can be super fun. Okay. Okay. Uh, this is slide 19. Um, oh yeah. And Angie, go ahead while I'm. Okay. So a bit about our play testing methodology. We do play at least a few rounds of every game. Um, I start looking for obvious accessibility barriers, and I also rely on other people around the table. Um, having these group conversations allows me to see um, different solutions, allows me to see what different people perceive as barriers, and sometimes talking through the barriers and talking through potential solution brings up ideas that I don't think of. I tend to, I've been a librarian for a long time, which means I think money is impossible. And so I can sometimes get very limited in my thinking about ways to modify a game and not always remember all the resources I have at my disposal. Um, and so hearing different perspectives and sometimes someone will come up with a small tweak that makes it oh so much better. Um, so, you know, we talk through the barriers and then we converse as a group after we played a few turns to talk about what do we think about this game in terms of accessibility? What do we think about this game in terms of suitability for a community event? Um, and we found it extremely helpful and Dan's gonna tell you why you should play test. Okay, so uh, to appreciate games, you have to play games and there's really not a great way that you can explain a game without playing it first. Um, it is, there are a lot of different ways to learn a game. They of course always come with a rule book. Uh, sometimes there are uh, videos that you can find that actually is a lot more common that you can watch and learn a game. Um, but in any circumstance, when it comes to, uh, uh, teaching a game, you really should have played with it, played with it a few times, uh, in order that you can communicate with a, with a new player. Uh, let's see. Oh, getting some messages. And while Dan is figuring out which villager gets devoured, um, I'm going to add that, you know, this is the only way to find the accessibility barriers. And I have personally found that it is a great way to teach about accessibility and to get people thinking about accessible design and inclusion. And it only takes a small push I found to get people who are, look, the reality is some people are never going to be receptive to learning about accessible and inclusive design. I may or may not have butted heads with some of these people a few times. Let's not talk about what's in my backyard. Um, but it's a great way to get people who are willing to listen, to start thinking about accessibility. It helps build community. We've built connections all across the university. And in fact, we built a lot of connections with our engineering faculty through the game testing. And we have, how many engineers are we up to, Dan, that are on the list to at least come every once in a while? Um. Top of my head, at least two, maybe three at this point now. 
Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it helps us build connections and um, we got people way outside of the library to help with our gaming event. Like people I would have never thought I had connections with, but through gaming, we're able to build those connections. And with the psychosocial moratorium, which I'll let Dan talk more about, because that's one of his favorite areas. So um, the psychosocial moratorium, that's it's basically um, it allows you to let go of anything that would make you as, uh, you know, sort of self-restricting. It it's, uh, allows a release of certain inhibitions um, because you're playing a game. When things are happening in a game, the consequences are for failure are extremely low. Um, you know, think about uh, to take a, to take an early example that most folks might know. Um, you you set up and you play a game of Super Mario Brothers, and you know you're running through it, and you ram yourself into a turtle, and you you lose a life. Uh, you start again within seconds. You are back already playing, making another attempt. So uh, one, it's teaching you to iterate, and also uh, failure really doesn't matter. And it, when you're in a situation um, that that failure doesn't matter, but it has a certain social component to it, it allows you to open up in ways because, well, this doesn't matter. This isn't really me. I'm I'm not. Uh, I'm I'm just playing a game. It's just a game. So I, I, that's that's the psychosocial moratorium, and it allows um, just some greater freedom. Sometimes there's a little bit of easing into the game, especially if you're in a classroom situation. Um, but uh, it, you know, it, it, it builds momentum very quickly, and it uh, gets people past their um, uh, sort of uh, inhibitions and barriers. Uh, games are just a fantastic way of going through that. And I don't, I, I don't have news on, on a murder yet. Um, well, that was unfortunate. It's but... we're, we're going to get there. We're going to get there. Okay. Um, but I would add too that it facilitates learning games in different ways. I've discovered, you know, as someone who teaches a lot and, as a librarian, we think a lot about how the brain works and how do we reach students. Um, so I think a lot about my own learning. And I've realized that in most situations, I want written directions with text. Um, I at least need that to get started on something. But with games, and I am I think in my case, maybe it's a bit of disconnect because of how my brain deals with visual information, being, you know, being born visually impaired, my brain deals differently with visual information. And I just can't make that connection between what the rules are describing and the game. But if I play a game, I tend to understand the rules very quickly and could teach the game to someone else very quickly. Uh, yep, here we go. Uh, slide 21, modifications. Ah, yes, we've had a lot of fun with this. Um, and, you know, I mentioned partnerships earlier. I think it's really important to make the point here that your library, your public library, your academic libraries, you know, depending on what type of organization you are, can be great partners in doing some of your own DYI modifications. Almost every public library now has at least a 3D printer, and they're usually willing to let you use that at cost. So that's going to greatly reduce costs involved with modifications because the costs of using a 3D printer are usually fairly modest. Um, or depending on the resources they have, you know, if you're a nonprofit or a, a city doing a recreational gaming event, they very well might be off, able to offer you some of the services for free. So if you don't have access to some of this technology, unless you're in a very, very small, very isolated area, chances are you have a nearby connection that does have access to, for example, 3D printing so that we can make tactile tokens. And we'll talk about a game later 
where the able-bodied sided players chose tactile tokens because that actually adds to the gaming experience. Um, I just started playing Sheriff of Nottingham and I'm starting to think about various ways to do tactile tokens for that particular game. Adding a neutral narrator, like we were talking about the Choose Your Own Adventure books earlier, um, adding a neutral narrator not only reduces the cognitive load on manipulating the pieces and following the rules of the story, because that's the responsibility of the narrator, but if you can find someone who's a really good dramatic reader or a little theatrical, a neutral narrator can actually add to the overall experience of playing a game and make it even more fun. Sometimes can, can I can I step in there for for just a moment, Angie? Yes. So speaking of neutral narrator, uh, Werewolf is a game that always requires someone uh, to see what's going on. And uh, in this way, I'll be uh, acting as the narrator. Uh, I have been in communication with uh, our werewolves, and I think we're ready to begin. So again, this is in a small uh, village, and this village has a problem. Um Night falls, and uh, this through this peaceful little town, uh, th three werewolves. I will give you. I will give the the villagers this much clue. There are three werewolves. You don't know who they are, but as day breaks, oh, I'm. I have the worst news uh, for the family of Carla Helton. Uh, for she has been uh, found torn limb from limb in her home. Um, clearly, this was not the work of human beings and something monstrous is afoot. Who could have done this sort of thing? It is now uh, open to all of the panelists, uh, all of our participants, uh, to accuse, discuss, and um find out who they think might be a werewolf and then at that at a point uh you will vote someone into exile a a uh, potential werewolf will be banished so um i guess really right now if you can unmute yourselves and uh begin discussion feel free to send chats to each other the really the question is uh who do you think did it I mean, there's what, 140 people in the village? That seems like a lot of potential candidates. It is a lot of candidates. Mm. Well, while our villagers are thinking about who might have devoured one of their own, um, I would add that sometimes just providing simple adaptive equipment and making sure that the games are compatible with adaptive equipment can go a long ways towards making a game accessible just providing simple things like magnification tools. While most people have them on their phones, I know I certainly do, um, sometimes it's just easier to grab a hand lens or, you know, it's also very important as a welcome signal that, hey, we've thought about accessibility and we know some of these might be a problem. So, hey, here are some magnifiers or here are some holders to help hold your hand of cards or if you're worried about concealing information here are some barriers you can put up if you want to um but you know just providing adaptive equipment because one of the things is often overlooked is making sure that a gaming event is accessible and is for everybody also means just throwing out those little signals that your adaptive technology is okay here. Um, your needs will be respected and we will try to find a way to get you into a game that you enjoy, especially if you are willing to tell us your needs and to say, well, maybe this game doesn't work for me, but hey, could I bring my own? Um, so just setting out that signal is very important. Now, do we know who has been vanished from the village or should we go on to the next slide? Oh, well, it seems like we're having some trouble with communications. So I think we might uh, we might do better to set this aside for the moment. Oh. Um, I will uh, to kind of describe the game in a bit more detail. Uh, when one is in 
uh, is in a group like that. Um, it one when one when we were playing this game in a group uh, in a room. It, depending on the number of players, uh, there's usually a proportional amount of werewolves. Sometimes the the number is known. Sometimes it's not. It's kind of a modifications can go into the game to make it easier or more difficult for either the villagers or the werewolves to win in a full game uh, like this, which is going to vary depending on uh, how outgoing, how so and everything everyone is um this it it can go by fairly quickly or it can take quite a while uh the game ends when uh the uh werewolves have been uh successfully exiled uh after a death there is always discussion and a vote and someone is uh sent off out of the village uh once all the werewolves have been eliminated uh the villagers win if the werewolves are ever at a majority in the village, they have won. Uh, because, keep in mind, no one knows who the werewolves are. So the werewolves themselves have a vote in who gets exiled. So really clever players who are the werewolves can end up getting rid of a lot of opposition if they're fast talkers. The trouble is, if you're a fast talker, that can also draw some attention. So this is the kind of social deduction game. And there's some with greater uh, complexity, some that, that take things in a different angle. But this is the general idea of what a very social, very narrative driven. And this is a game that can be played with nothing more than a deck of cards or even just a few strips of paper. Um, it is very little, very little entry. And, um, you know, if this were, uh, uh, unfortunately it's it, with some technical difficulties, this is, this isn't working out as well, uh, uh, as we had hoped. So I think we'll step back from the game. Um, but uh, thank you guys for, for your willingness to part, to try and participate. Sorry, we weren't able to make that work quite as well. Um, I did. Yeah, we did have one murder, but, uh, I think we can't all see the participants. So it's a little harder to keep that going. Anyway, um, are we ready to move on? Uh, let's see. We'll move on to slide 22. Um, so, yeah, continuing on our uh, modifications. Yeah. So one of the real dilemmas is whether to make or buy modifications. And this is going to vary depending on your organizational needs and the resources your organization has. Um, the cost of commercially available modified games, like we have the Braille and large print from Monopoly from Maxi Aids, is at least quadruple the cost of normal Monopoly. However, the cost for Brailled Uno and Skipbo cards was quite low. I'd say maybe double standard cost i th i think we paid twenty dollars for both games uh in braille so, so yeah about double what you what you'd normally expect yeah so but twenty dollars is it a fairly reasonable investment that you know most people would be able to make at some point whereas a hundred dollars especially for a game and especially for monopoly which Chances are it's going to get thrown up in the air. Someone cries, okay, grandma, you win. Are you happy now? Um, you know, that is a more difficult investment for individuals or families to make. So where that break point is, is going to vary quite a lot. Um, and the resources you have, we're very fortunate that we have student designers that I can say, hey, Jess, and Jess is often involved in our playtesting, but I can say, hey, Jess, we have this idea for these tokens. Can you like, you know, design them in Tinkercad and print them out for us? Or could you design them in Inkscape and use the laser cutter? Um, so we have options. We are looking at releasing some of our previous mods as open source so that people can find them. Um, there are some technical difficulties to work through with that, but contact us and we will let you know what we've got and what sort of files we're able to release. Um, 
but you know what are the costs as far as the time versus the cost to buy something commercial or unfortunately very few games are available with commercial modifications so is this our only option but there are several game crafting sites that i know dan could talk about and also thingiverse where you can find 3d objects that people have already created usually using tinkercad that they're willing to put out there for free or for very low cost um so i'm just gonna uh i don't know if folks can see me hold this up here's kind of an example of what we're talking about um here and i'm gonna i'm just gonna very briefly stop my share um so this is a die uh this is actually from a game called hipster dice um, which is really, this is the only element to it. Um, it's a standard size die. It's got a uh, six, so it, you know, is typical six sided. Um, it has symbols on each side rather than, than numbers or pips uh, corresponding to the game. Um, this is the 3D printed version of this same uh, die that we just took um, the same basic design and was able to 3D print this out. And, you know, we've, you know, I'm, I'm I'm not great at math, so I'm not sure of the scale, but you know, here's one that is far more accessible um just from a, a visual standpoint. So uh wanted to show that off uh just briefly. So let me go back to our slideshow here. Well, and those are embossed or bar relief. We've done both. Yeah, uh, yeah. That are significant enough that you can actually feel and could determine what the category was from feeling around the symbols. Uh, so some of the uh, some of the things that we purchased, this is uh, the, the Braille and large print monopoly. Um, you can probably see there, uh, it's basically a monopoly board that has had some aftermarket modifications and then repackaged and resold uh, as this Braille version. And uh, as Angie mentioned, um, while this is incredibly well done, we got some of the most fantastic feedback from our students on how great they think it is that something like this exists. Um, you're going to pay probably about 20 bucks for a new uh a new inbox monopoly and this this is a hundred dollars um so just uh, you know it, it's the it's the disability tax unfortunately um when really you could easily ma mass produce um a board that has this overlay and uh you know, printing larger cards. It's just doing it on a smaller scale makes it very difficult. Uh, okay, next slide, slide 24. This is showing off our uh, Tactile Connect 4. And I'll just draw your attention to uh, how the uh, yellow, uh, uh, um, yellow pieces have a hole drilled through the middle um, that overcomes both color blindness and, um, you know, other visual impairment because you can feel the difference. Uh, this is a modification that is, it's honestly kind of a no brainer. Um, you know, you could buy Connect 4 and if you've got uh, the simplest power drill or hole punch at home, you can pretty much make this same thing. Um, but again, this was something purchased uh, by a company that then does aftermarket modifications for this. Uh, so, you know, Connect 4, five bucks at Walmart. Uh, this was, I want to say, 15 to 20. So, you know, again... Not outrageous, not difficult to do. But again, if we did this as if industry practice uh, would build this in, it's a very simple modification. It could be done with very little increased in cost and, and not necessarily passed on to the consumer. And not only does this make a better game uh, more accessible to more people, uh, even for the able-bodied, it enhances the experience. Um, you've just got another way that you can tell. It's another quick way to read it. Uh, it also, you know, it gives something for younger players to kind of have a little bit more uh, tactile connection to. And since this is a game uh, mostly designed for younger players, I think it's it's great for that as well. 
All right, so this is Avalon. Uh, Avalon is another social deduction game. It's a bit more elaborate than Werewolf, uh, but it does have a, a lower cap. Uh, takes about five to 10 players, and uh, players are either uh, loyal servants of Arthur or uh, evil minions of Mordred. And uh, after a number of quests are either succeeded or failed, uh, one side or the other wins, but no one knows who they who, who is going on these missions and if the if mordred is sent on a mission he can decide that it fails so again uh, it's it's a um kind of a dance of a uh, hidden movement and hidden intentions and backstabbing very very social um and uh but also plays really quickly uh, this one, it, it is uh, the basics of it are card base. We've got here a couple of examples of 3D printed tokens that uh, our our student Jess made in our innovation lab. Um, these can be the the little bags there. They can be hidden inside that. And so, rather than having a card that you have to keep secret. Everyone has a tiny little bag that they can reach in and feel who they are uh, without revealing that information. So very tactile and much easier to keep things a secret. Uh, and uh, again, this was something where we had these tactile tokens out and um, everyone went for them. Uh, Avalon you know this uh, our event took place over the course of an entire afternoon running from uh 1 p.m to 7 p.m and um i don't think the avalon table was ever not full um it, it people went for it and we're really impressed with uh the modified tokens that we created uh, so this is one that is actually uh not an not an aftermarket uh uh, modification per se. Uh, this is Azul, uh, which is a very, uh, a rather simple and absolutely beautiful uh, pattern building game. Uh, you're using uh, tiles to create aesthetic patterns that actually tie into uh, some historical uh, places. This is based on um, the Azulejos, which was uh, built into the palace of. Um, Oh, I'm going to forget. Uh, uh, King Manuel I of Portugal, who fell in love with this design after visiting uh, the Alhambra and seeing the beautiful blue and white azulejos tiles. Uh, so anyway, it, it's got there's a little history lesson in there for you, too. And then um, the original game, the pieces, uh, it was hard to kind of control on the board because they would just lay on top of it. So they later released this crystal mosaic expansion. Um, the original game, Azul, is uh, between $30 and $40. You can typically find it. Um, mostly you'll find it in specialty stores, but it's becoming more common uh, as we're seeing a lot of these prestige board games become part of the public consciousness more. You'll see it in places like Target, Walmart. Walmart. This is one of those that's beginning to break through. Uh, the Crystal Mosaic expansion, uh, it was about $10. It adds a couple of different options for board setups. And then the main feature, and if you can kind of tell there, is this sort of plastic overlay. Um, this, is, this makes the game far more accessible uh, for folks that have uh, difficulty with fine motor control uh, because it allows you, it, it just holds the pieces in place better. Um, um, an errant, you know, hand knocking against something isn't going to scatter your pieces. Uh, uh, an innocent jiggling of the table isn't going to loosen things up a bit. And here we have, again, something really not designed with accessibility in mind per se. This was designed for a typical consumer to uh, enhance their own experience with the game if they wanted to shell out really just a few bucks more to do it. Um, and yet, Along mm. with it, um, it brought along this tremendous change that made, uh, you know, it's a simple change and yet it's tremendous in uh, how much more accessible it makes the game. Uh, so, uh, some communication. Which is my specialty. <laughs> um, so, with a lot of event planning, which I've done quite a bit of over the years, Communication is key. 
communication about what to expect during the event, communication about the event so that people know that you're doing something. But communication can also go a long way towards promoting an environment that welcomes disabled people and an environment where disabled people know they will find games that they can play or at a minimum, a dignified way to participate as an observer if that's what you wanna do, which is what some people want to do. So having good descriptions of the games and or modifications available, allow people to decide what games meet their needs. Cause like I said, there is no universally accessible game. There's no universally, no game that is going to have universal appeal either. Um, games are going to be a very complex individual decision, but it's about creating an event that welcomes people and that has something for everybody somehow. Um, you know, some people do not like ambiguous or changing rules. So card games like Flux would just be a nightmare. Um, but if they know that, they know, okay, I don't want to play Flux. Maybe I want to try something else. Um, creating a common world can be challenging for new groups. Um, that's something I discussed with one of my old human factors and psychology professors. Um, world building often implies, you know, a longer term relationship to be, at least if it's going to be very successful. Social deduction games might not work with people who are some sort, have some sort of neurodivergence or mental illness, or maybe they just don't want a people tonight. They want to find a game that's maybe a little more focused on the game or the world building. But communication about what to expect is going to allow people to choose something that works for them and still preserve their dignity. Um, also, encouraging people to bring and teach their own games is a great way to promote community and to promote inclusion by allowing people to bring in something that works for them. So next slide, I have a couple of game descriptions that I will go ahead and read. Uh, I'm going to have to minimize this right quick. Okay, so Flux, if you don't like unpredictable things, skip this game. If you like a quick and wild ride, pick up this quick card game with a variety of themes to appeal to everyone's taste. <coughs> so I'm trying to actually convey quite a bit of information there, um, you know, about the unpredictable nature of the game, the fact that it's quick, so low commitment, maybe... Um, committing to a game that's going to take an hour or two is just not in the cards for that person that night. They know that this game is going to be quick. Um, we have a variety of themes. So this kind of gives people a clue about who this may and may not appeal to. Avalon, who among those sitting at the table is a traitor? If you enjoy gossip, speculation, and smack talking, Enjoy a round of this social deduction game. We've created tactile tokens so that more people can enjoy backstabbing and entry. Um, so I think it's important there to get across, you know, what are the pros and cons of this game? Um, who might this appeal to or who might it absolutely not appeal to? Um, you know, and by saying, hey, if you like this, I'm also implying if you don't like this, this might not be the game for you. Um, you know, we don't have to be clinical or um, overly specific in our descriptions. And of course, that's also going to depend on your language. If your gaming event is set to appeal to developmentally disabled adults, then maybe we want to go a different route with our game descriptions. Um, but knowing your audience and knowing what information you're trying to convey and then think of what's the fun way that I can convey this information. Do you have anything to add to that, Dan, before we move on? Um, well, I would just add, sort of add that, you know, from a library perspective, 
um, or rather from a librarian perspective, uh, something that, uh, you know, that's fairly common in our business, uh, particularly in public libraries is reader's advisory, um, which is, it really comes down to, Hey, what are some things that you've enjoyed reading? Um, based on that, here's some other things that you might enjoy, uh, creating events like this, uh, becoming familiar with a broad variety of uh, types of games, both from a mechanic standpoint, a theme standpoint, uh, you know, the a, uh, complexity and time investment. It's just great if you have a broad understanding of the types of things in general that are on offer. And then that way, you know, someone can see Avalon and uh, see this description and get a great idea of the kind of thing that it is. Uh, and then from there, you know, if they, if they try it out and enjoy it, you can get into, uh, or if they want to know more about it, uh, the box itself is going to illuminate, you know, number of players, time investment. Uh, there's also some resources I'll show a bit later, uh, that actually, uh, takes games, uh, breaks them down into a description, uh, from both the publisher and then from audience response uh uh it's a place called board game geek so we'll be taking a look at that a little bit later too but yeah it's it's a having knowledge of the types of games and figuring out if someone likes is looking for uh something like flux because they want a quick card game um you know hey you like this you'll like these so uh, yeah i guess really just the reader's advisory aspect was or player's advisory rather was what i wanted to to bring up there all right so uh slide 29 uh game day setup so um Hale Library on our K-State campus it is pretty centrally located um it is uh one of the larger buildings on campus, there's about 500,000 square feet. Uh, we have five floors, uh, mostly is, you know, given over equally to like uh, individual and collaborative study space, but also, you know, uh, um, neighborhood of 1 million physical volumes plus our, you know, hundreds of databases. It's a big space and it's a space that does require some navigation. So uh, trying to figure out where uh, to have this so that people who knew about the event uh, could come in and find it easily and some place that had a lot of traffic uh, so that passersby uh, would see it and also be interested. Um, so yeah, we made just kind of an arch very near the entrance to the library, uh, but just out of the way enough that it wasn't going to impede people coming in and uh, immediately crossing over to uh, seek assistance at at our help desk. Um, but just if they were progressing there, there was no way they were going to miss the fact that hey, there's a bunch of board games that are over at the other end here. Um, ringers at several tables. So. Uh, when you create an event like this, um, even if you have knowledge of all of these games, you cannot be at every table. It's fantastic to have some floaters that can move around and make sure how things are going. But if you possibly can uh, have a ringer to keep an eye on either each table or to keep an eye on several tables so that as folks come in, they don't need to sit down and try to teach themselves the game. Uh, that some experts, gaming, you know, experienced gamers, they can absolutely sit down and teach it themselves. But it is the new folks that you are wanting to keep an eye out for. They're the ones that are going to need your help. And so, uh, you know, having ringers that are that are experienced and can teach them is always great. Uh, it's nice if you can have a, a sort of a logical uh, 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 arrangement and, and it's great to have like lowest commitment to more commitment. So you have kind of on the, on the outer ring. Oh, any of these games, uh, these are, uh, going to be something I can learn in five minutes and play a whole game in 15 to 20. Uh, as you move,
move in, you get into something a little bit longer and a little bit more complex. And then what's uh, what you can do and what we sort of had planned for was to have a uh, sort of a centerpiece of, okay, this is a big complex game and uh, you can see all the different pieces and parts and uh, what kinds of things can happen with it. Um, but you have that sort of going on as a uh, more as kind of a conversation centerpiece. Um, you might, if you're very lucky, you might get some people that are willing to jump in and play, uh, play something like, um, you know, Twilight Imperium. That's well, depending on who you've got is going to be at least a four hour commitment to play that. Um, so just kind of, uh, we, we arranged ours in sort of a series of concentric rings with the most complex at the middle and then outward. Um, but some kind of arrangement like that. So it just makes the flow easier for, uh, people to make their way among it. And then, uh, the, uh, all of our game descriptions that Angie and I created, uh, we placed those on all table on, on, uh, the signs and, you know, had, uh, had games more or less set up and ready to go if people wanted to sit down and just get started. Um, it is never a bad idea uh, to have your, your descriptions written in a couple of different styles. Um, you know, the Angie uh, had shared her two examples. Um, she is, you know, having studied journalism, she is a bit more concise. Having studied theater myself, I'm a little bit more verbose. So, you know, we each play to our strengths when we're writing uh, these descriptions. Um, Angie, was there anything you wanted to add to that? Uh, no, I think we're good to talk about what went well and, oh, what we would change. What we would change. Okay. Oh, uh, right, right before that, we've got, this is just a picture oh, yeah. of some of our students playing uh, Avalon. Um, if you, uh, you can kind of see here. Um, they are, uh, they are playing more or less, you can kind of see the bags and the tokens, uh, they are using the, uh, 3d printed pieces that we provided, uh, the cards and the sort of, uh, I would say in some ways, maybe simpler, uh, uh, arrangements, those were ignored because they really liked the tactile nature, uh, of the tokens that we had created. So, um, you know, really successful in uh, uh, in getting people to connect, not just with the games, but with the modifications that we created. This was just at Avalon. I I don't know that we can recommend it enough as uh, a fantastic centerpiece for an event like this uh, because it works uh, on on just a number of great levels. Uh, so, what worked? Our uh, our numbers were uh, fantastic. Um, this, uh, we arranged with uh, a class, a DAS 100 class to come in, um, that, uh, got us, I think 118 just from, well, uh, we had 118 participants total and that's kind of a rough count. Um, but pretty much where we were standing at there. Um, let's see, Angie, do you want to talk about, uh, engagement a little bit? Well, yeah, so the engagement was phenomenal. It was actually even better than I expected. We um, we got coverage from our student newspaper. And, you know, if your organization is trying to make more connections in the community, I can tell you as a journalist that this makes a fantastic human interest story. And there are definitely ways to pitch it and ways to do it to ensure that it does not leap into inspo porn, which not a fan of. Um, but we had great engagement. We got some students who spoke up and provided our newspaper with great quotes about what they were learning and what they were understanding. And from a disability perspective, this was also a great way to get some people who maybe really didn't know much about disability and some of the realities of being a disabled person to start thinking differently and perhaps become allies and work towards greater inclusion and um, accessibility friendly design um, in all aspects of life. So the student reactions were fabulous. And I'll let Dan in a minute talk about what some of his students said, because there were some that I'll admit kind of verged towards inspo porn, but you know, we got to start somewhere. 
I was kind of surprised. Um, we offered both Cards Against Humanity and Apples to Apples. Nobody took the Apples to Apples. They all wanted it wild. So, uh, but that table was never empty. Um, I was kind of surprised at some of the games that I thought, well, you know, this, it might be harder to get students to play these because they're a little more complex or they're unfamiliar, but Azul, uh, Avalon went absolutely swimmingly. Um, but Azul and Sherlock Holmes, uh, Consulting Detective are a little more complex games, but those were also very, very popular. Um, I think that our setup scheme worked really, really well. What do you want to say also about some of your students' reactions, Dan. Well, in his, the students in his section of DAS 100 had the advantage, we'll say, of uh, listening to me a couple of class sessions before talking about human factors and um, what happens to disabled people in disaster situations. So they were somewhat already primed, but some of the reactions I thought were still quite nice. So if you want to say something about that. Uh, sure, sure. Um, I should mention too, DAS 100 is our introduction to K-State culture. Uh, so it's all freshmen, it's all first semester, um, and it's a lot of a, uh, a, a series of events that are getting them acclimated to uh, cultural experiences that they can find, clubs that they might be interested in, uh, and student services that they may be unaware of. Um, so uh, it was with this in mind that students uh, came to uh, this event uh, as part of an assignment and uh, several other sections also of this same class also uh, required their students to come to this. Um, with some of my students' reactions, uh, some of the ones that struck me the most, um, now this one is probably coming from a uh, religious obligation viewpoint, but there was a young man who um, I had not, he, he was not uh, typically fired up, but his response, um, but he, I, he particularly, he played a lot of the, uh, a lot of Monopoly. Uh, he just thought the, um, it wasn't so much the game, just the uh, changes that were made, the modifications with the large print and Braille, he thought were were really cool. Um, and when he <laughs> learned the price difference, the fact that it's about five times the cost, he was absolutely outraged. He thought our society was failing our uh, was failing people, and that from uh, his own personal, very strong Catholic convictions, uh, something has to be done about this, and. Um, just the, uh, there's nothing quite like 18 year old, uh, righteous indignation, um, for a cause that you yourself believe in. Like there's, there's a number of things that you're getting wrong about this, but I, the passion with which he <laughs> wrote meant it, it really struck me and, and it gave a sense that like the, these issues are not well known and when people know about them, when they come to understand them, um, it gives hope that there's uh, uh, we're moving in the right direction towards greater accessibility. And uh, so, so you know, that was just one I wanted to add. Yeah. yeah. Like I said, some of them were, you know, problematic in one way or another, but I, the fact that we were getting more buy-in and getting more awareness to some of these students. That's true. The the buy-in was very big. They all wrote that they saw value in it. Uh, not all of them were uh, were as vehement, and um, not all of them had necessarily the same perspectives. But everyone saw value in having a greater understanding of uh, how it is to interact with things as a disabled person. Right. And this is something we were able to do without using disability simulations, mm. without, you know, with making it more about an experience than activism, but at the same time, still raising gr greater awareness and getting people to actually care about an issue and start thinking about it. And then, oh, what didn't work? <laughs> well, we had some fun with this. Slide one. 32, what we might change. <laughs> 
Um, I should have done more nagging of our volunteers, perhaps even clubbing some of the um some of them on the head like baby seals game day and dragging them down to the location because so nag your volunteers is what I'm saying. Lots of gentle reminders. Um we, Dan and I, I think wasted too much energy staffing the welcome desk. So uh, when we needed to be out and around circulating and really interacting with people. So I would probably have recruited volunteers to person our welcome desk where we could kind of tell people what was going on. Um, we tried to like have a ringer for every game. But then when people don't come and play that game for hours, that volunteer, you know, so trying to have people versed in multiple games so that they're comfortable leading different tables and kind of going with the flow and going with the people is probably something we'll do differently next time because we are going to do this next time. And if I could change the audacity of some people, I absolutely would because I'll let Dan tell you more about what happened to King of Tokyo. Oh, no, it was, um, I mean, there's there's not a whole lot to tell. We had King of Tokyo set up as part of a the clearly designated area with signs, with displays saying that was part of game day. And at first I thought, oh, there's a group of students that sat down to play King of Tokyo. And then I noticed that all the pieces had been kind of recklessly swept into the box which was set to the side and they were uh set up and were having a study session right there um now if the library were extremely crowded on this particular day um you know that's maybe more understandable but uh when there are other tables available and here is a table that clearly has something uh, of you know fortunately there was no damage but there uh there wasn't a whole lot of care put in putting it away so mind the audacity of some people and um you know some people throw rocks at things that shine as uh you know as taylor swift sings um so so yeah just a thing to watch out for yeah so apparently we need ringers to guard the tables as well yeah <laughs> Um, so again, here is just our uh, contact information. Um, uh, it should be available in multiple spaces, but you can uh, find us here. Um, and then um, that is pretty much our uh, presentation. Uh, Colleen, I don't know if you want to take us through these slides or if we open it up for uh, Q and A. But um, hi, yeah, great. Um, maybe you know, I think we got about five minutes maybe for questions. So if anybody out there has some questions about, um, you know, the accessible gaming experience or needs some tips or suggestions, um, we did have one person who um, kind of both question and comment, I think. Um, he says he has a son who's nine. Um, his son plays a, a game that he feels is probably for older kids you know, teens and above, but um, as a father who's deaf, he has no way of hearing what he's doing. Um, and his son is quite verbal. And he says he wishes that games could be captioned, but uh, he've, he's had to uh, turn on, he says, Otter AI or one of the other translators to listen in. He says, I think my child could have more time on games if I was able to follow along from a distance or sit next to him once in a while and watch what's being said. He says, my disability affects how much time he is on games. Um, so if they're, if they're talking about video games, those are supposed to be captioned and that's something you can sue over. <laughs> um, unfortunately with board games, it gets a little trickier, but um, several video game manufacturers are being sued for various accessibility concerns because video games, like websites, like apps, fall under the ADA. And, um, you know, working to make manufacturers aware of that um, and sometimes bringing in the lawyers is very helpful. But I would also say double check, if we're talking video games, 
double check that captioning isn't an option because it actually is on some games, but finding the accessibility settings can be rather tricky. And there are in fact several um, guides to game accessibility online. Um, I know that we've compiled a list of those resources. I don't have them handy, but if you email either Dan or I, we can actually get that list to you if that helps. That would be great. And what I could do is just include it in the in the follow up email that has the survey. OK, so that all the participants can get that. OK, yeah. Uh, let's see. Um, anybody else have any thoughts or questions? Um, my question for you is what what have you seen is the most kind of consistent and easy, potentially easy to overcome barrier with gaming? You know, um, something that really is a quick fix. Over dependence on color. Uh, OK, this this is incredibly common. And, you know, the addition of an extra symbol on a card of a certain color, mm -hmm. um, a, a, even just a different style of writing, a different border, something that that can be supplementary to color um, really works well. And and is uh, and sometimes we see uh, the it is something that I've seen in um, the AAA board game industry in the past mm -hmm. couple of years. Uh, one, I see I've seen them even when they rely on color, uh, moving away from red and green as color yeah. options. Right. So, you know, progress is being made. I've been seeing some of the additions of uh, symbols in addition to color or, um, you know, if, if the players have different colors of figures, they also have slightly different shapes or uh, are in different positions. So um, the it, it's that idea idea is starting to at least uh, uh, impact uh, creators and designers. Mm -hmm. um, and it is one of those, uh, you know, getting away from a reliance on color is one of those things that um, that you can uh, are pretty easy to make modifications, 3D printing some uh, some other tokens that have, you know, again, symbols, emblems, something tactile that can help tell the difference. Yeah, no, that makes sense. When, I know we, in my house, we're big magic card players, and they've got the little element symbols on each one. So that's that's an example of using that. Um, Angie, mm -hmm. what were you going to say? Well, for me, the lack of games with tactile tokens is really strange, especially yeah. once I started playing games with tactile tokens, because the cost difference, if you're bulk printing you know, bulk manufacturing plastic is not high. Um, right, right. And actually, I I would be surprised if it were higher than four color printing, because I don't think it is. Um, and there are so many tactile tokens that can be so easily made. And that can also kind of contrib contribute to the fun and mysticism of a game. And you can still have something that's packable. Sure. It's just going to require a different philosophy and a different design and packaging. There's so much that manufacturers could be doing with very little cost difference if the will were there. Right. Yep. Got to change the mindset. So um, I think that's probably what we have time for at this point. And so I see your contact information here. And mark your calendars for next month's webinar. Uh, it will be with a guest from AARP, the American Association of Retired Persons on Livable Communities. What does it mean uh, to have a livable community? And what are all the different factors and features um, that make it so that um, people can age, um, age gracefully into their, into their community? Uh, this is on February 15th from 2 to 3 p.m. You can register at adainfo.org. Uh, just go into the training tab, find the list of webinar trainings, and register on the event page. And slide 36, thank you for joining us. Thank you again uh, from the Mid-Atlantic ADA Center. Uh, again, you can reach 
um, any ADA center from across the country by calling 1-800-949-4232. Um, all information, um, all technical assistance information is free. So, um, and then if you um, are, if you have an area code within one of the Mid-Atlantic states, you have to call the local number three or sorry, if you're outside of our area, you would call the local number 301-217-0124. Um, thank you again, Daniel and Angie for joining us. Um, I hope everybody out there has a great rest of the day.